Hey, okay, are we going? I think we might be going. Um, hello. Can you hear me? I suppose is the first thing. Can anybody, anybody there to comment and let me know? Can you see me and hear me? And that kind of thing. Um, just making sure all the tech stuff is working. Because it doesn't always perform, as you know. Okay. Anybody out there? Hello, thank you. <laughs> At least I know. Can you hear you can hear me and see me and all of those sorts of things? I hope. Hello, thank you. Hi Josephina. Lovely to see you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody's commenting. That's brilliant. Thanks a million. <laughs> uh, with many O's. Oh, 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 oh. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay. So um, there's been lots of people talking about um, uh, enrichment. Yeah, I turned the captions on. I hope that helps um, for those who need that. Um, I'll also, what I'll do is <laughs> more O's. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I also have some um, like document on this too. So I'll add anything that extra to it so just a presentation i'll just post it as like a pdf or send a link to it or whatever just to round it out make sure it's accessible for everybody and then you can contact me through the group or wherever there's so many different ways of contacting um, and then if anybody has questions afterwards then um I, i'll be available for that too so my name is Anne rogers and i'm from a company in ireland uh, based in dublin called anied animal education is really what we're about um and in i think it was january 2019 I launched this program called 100 Days of Enrichment and was piggybacking back on uh, or piggybacking on the kind of tech moves. There was like 100 days of like programming and all sorts of different tech things that I don't know about. Um, and it was really about establishing good habits and things like that. And I thought, oh, why not? apply that to you know enrichment tasks on a daily basis and then i realized oh there's a hundred days of this and so much um stuff to go into it so it has been <laughs> both a, a pleasure and a curse <laughs> but um it's grown and grown and grown and grown and it's great because we're starting to get um you know real recognition people are really interested in enrichment and we run it, it's always available. It's free. I've put the link in the description of this video, so you might be able to see that. You can go there. From there, you can join our Facebook group where lots of participation happens and there's tons of interaction between all these cool people, pros and pet owners and everybody else in between. Um, and it's a really nice um, community. We've run it particularly in relation to like lockdowns and all the depression and um, sadness and greyness and awfulness that goes along with that. And we're, we're in the middle of a run. We're actually, uh, hello, we're actually uh, day 50, midway through um, on Monday. So that's pretty cool. We're halfway through and um, loads of people are still involved. You, you see a drop off, you know, as we go the first two weeks, it's really intense. And there's like th literally thousands of people involved. And then we have the real diehards sticking around. So it's great that, the, that there's still such a huge number of people um, sticking around. So today I thought we would talk um, about uh, enrichment like and lots of people at this awesome um, gathering have been talking about enrichment um, so I don't want to you know be going over all of the, that brilliant stuff because lots of people have been talking about lots of brilliant things um, but certainly I thought we might talk about 100 days a little bit and where it came from and what's happening with it and things like that um, and what it's based on I suppose um, enrichment has certainly become a bit of a buzzword in the dog world um, and everybody has heard about it and there's tons of groups and books and all sorts of things and that's fantastic because it means that people are thinking more than just about um, obedience and control. Like they're thinking about those things too, obviously, uh, but um, that they're thinking a little bit more about um, quality of life and they're thinking a little bit more about the experiences that their dogs or other pets need. Um, and that's a fantastic thing. But because once things become a, a kind of a buzzword, it can um, we can start to lose the real meaning of it. And I think right now there's a lot of emphasis on like food dispensing toys and really complicated puzzles and things like that um, and I think 
you we have to be careful with that because it's not always actually um enriching and that's something that we're going to talk a little bit about um but also um we want to make sure that we're providing well-rounded enriched environments for our pets and i think this is the perfect venue for this because um we're all talking about reinforcement based approaches to caring for um our dogs and caring for our human clients as well and for ourselves um, and i think enrichment proper appropriate enrichment and you'll hear me say that a lot uh, fits really really well um into that at any point that you have a question or you want me to slow down or um shut up or whatever um just pop it uh, there in the comment box i'm keeping an eye on that and trying to respond to everybody's comments as they come along so just stop me at any point any question no problem we get covered what we get covered i am um an awful one for going off on a tangent so you only need to hint at some other topic and we'll go off on that for god knows how long so but there's no problem i think we're pretty uh pretty relaxed um here so uh pop off a comment there no problem and uh any questions that you have and we'll get we'll get right to it no problem at all okay so the whole um program i've stuck the link there for you so you can have a look at that at, at any um point and i think one of the things that's um really starting to reveal itself about enrichment is is that sometimes it can be a little bit like oh we've given the dog a Kong toy or we've given the dog whatever the puzzle du jour is you know um and we kind of declare oh you know you're enriched um and uh, there we go and really at this point we understand looking really at other captive animals and it's sometimes difficult for us to think about our pet dogs uh, our pet animals companion animals um as captive animals and they are they're living in an environment that uh, we have constructed for them and it's generally functional for us and it's usually attractive to us so it's not necessarily uh, what dogs uh, might choose and certainly domestication helps with that because that's something that we do with domestication we make sure that animals are better prepared for um, living with humans and I think that's uh, really important but we also have done this weird thing with dogs we've spent hundreds of years making sure that they can do very specific jobs and then we've decided okay well you're not going to do that job anymore uh, now you're just going to live on my sofa um, and there's a big gap then there um, for dogs and certainly there is a need for filling that gap for a lot of dogs but there's also a need for having you know really really good companion dogs that can cope with um, all the things that humans need them to be able to cope with but in the interim and what we have to do in order to make sure that uh, our dog's welfare is um, improved and is kept up is we have to make sure that we're filling that gap with something else. So it's not just enough to give our dogs something to do. It's not just enough to keep them busy. All of those things function for us. So I suppose the, the first thing we have to start asking is, what do dogs need? Um, and this comes down to asking questions like, what are, dog, what are dogs? Um, how do they function in the ecological world that they inhabit and this can be really really difficult because we think of the world we inhabit as being something that works for dogs because they dogs are really adaptive they're also really tolerant of um what people do and how people keep them like you know the stuff that we put them through and expect them to um cope with is beyond unreasonable <laughs> um really and dogs are, are heroes in that respect so dogs have specific needs and those needs come before obedience whatever the hell that is um, and they come before our expectations of them so before we even start to get to to talk about a dog we need to start thinking about what can we offer them in terms of meeting their needs they need social contact and dogs need social contact with people and they need social contact with people from really really early on to ensure that they're going to be able to cope in the human world for life they need choice in those interactions. So we need to build in ways to allow dogs to opt out and opt in as they wish. And again, because dogs tend to be very tolerant of us, they tend to really um, put up with us a whole lot. It can be difficult to um, really clearly say when a dog is actually choosing to be there because they love it and they want to be in the middle of it and when a dog is just kind of tolerating us and we're never about mere tolerance we want joy in every interaction that we um, that we have with dogs and that starts with making sure that they have a choice there. Dogs need physical and mental entertainment 
they need both they need a balance of of these things and those might be according to those uh, an individual's needs dogs need functional spaces so they need things like a place where they can sleep separate to where they eat separate to where they uh, toilet and they need predictability and controllability and those things are essential so really what we're saying is dogs need safety security companionship entertainment and hygienic living conditions and none of that is unreasonable um i think that's absolutely reasonable and they should be able to expect that they can have that um highland and finn i know finn well via the computer um <laughs> um so that's really you know what 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 enrichment is about first what do dogs need and we know that there's been all sorts of changes when we go down the next level so we zoom into the next level so we go from species wide or species typical needs and then we go to breed or type related needs and then it becomes a little bit more specialized and then we zoom in again and we start talking about individuals and their specific living conditions um, and you all know that you, you could have somebody out there could have several of one specific type of dog or one breed of dog so there could be somebody with several spaniels it could be somebody with a house full of german shepherds and even though they might be very closely related and very similar in lots of ways there's going to be a ton of um, individual requirements there for for each for each dog, and that can make this a little bit more complicated because we don't have um, a magic formula that we can say yes, just do this thing. So just give the dog a Kong, and we we've achieved enrichment, and away we go. So I think you know that's a really important part of enrichment planning. And then when we kind of consider all of those things, then we have to start thinking about well, what do we prioritize? You know resources are often limited time might be limited when we talk about um you know average pet owners sometimes skill and knowledge and uh, motivation might be limited so we, we have to think about well what um what is it that we are uh, prioritizing and when we come to the end of this with whatever time we have left we'll talk a little bit about individualizing um this sort of stuff so that you you get the opportunity to do that and that's really it, it comes down to that we start thinking well do we prioritize this or we do, do we prioritize this um and really it comes down to asking the animal that is our go all the time we're all the time asking um the dog or asking cat or whatever animal it is that we're um working with hi bowie um i know miss bowie as well hello everybody i just want to make sure i see all of these because once we get into this um you loud and clear and you got your chocolate biscuits good woman orla i love it um so <clears throat> we're talking um a little bit about what dogs uh, need as a species and we might talk about um what they need as um as individuals as given the type of dog that they are the breed of dog they are the living conditions they're in where they've come from the experience they've had through life um and lots of other um contributing factors i'm going to try and do share share screen right now God knows if this will work because we're relying on technology and I have no idea where that button has gone. Oh wait, it's here. Yeah. Um, so just, no, let me do it. Oh, well then, well that answers that question. We're not doing that, but it, I'll, I'll, I'll um, stick, to, this is all gonna be in a thing for you. So you'll have it. But uh, one of the things that we often look at when we, when we start talking about um, dog's needs is we start to look at um, modal action patterns. So patterns of behavior that are installed in animals from birth. And we mentioned already things like functional spaces. So uh, dogs liking to have a place to toilet away from where they sleep, for example. So that's kind of installed information that comes with dogs. It is, it, it's, it, it's a kind of an essential kind of essence of dogs. But we also often talk about in relation to enrichment, we often talk about predatory related behavior and this kind of predatory sequence. So this tracking, stalking, chasing, and, and so on right through to you know grab bites and, and kill bites and and uh, dissecting and so on um, and this often gives us information about what dogs probably need to do all dogs probably have all of that in there somewhere and selective breeding has kind of um emphasized it or um inhibited it uh, over time but really all dogs will 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 need to do a lot of this stuff most of the time um <clears throat> 
so we, we we very often structure a lot of the enrichment protocols that we do for dogs surrounding that and we want to make sure that dogs have appropriate outlets for all of those behaviors and um, by doing that by providing that we get to ask the dog a little bit we go well, what do you really like um, and what are you really getting into and what are you really uh, seeming to enjoy and then we can enhance that and emphasize that in our, our program a little bit so when it comes to kind of prioritizing things we have to throw some stuff out there and allow the dog choose what it is that they really like so it comes down to our our observations and some data collection um i suppose one of the things and that's all great and that's all really really important and and we want to make sure that we have some awareness of our dog's needs um like that at species level at breeder type level and then at individual level so there's kind of those three um three levels of that but one of the things that tends to not be talked about a whole lot and something that I grapple with a little bit is that, you know, is this relationship between enrichment and training? So where is the line? Is there a line? Is it the same thing? Is it not? And this is certainly argued in the literature. You're probably aware that enrichment really started in zoos and wild animal um, collections with captive animals. And it was really emphasized for the likes of marine mammals uh, in captivity. It was emphasized for large um, carnivorous mammals like, you know, big cats and things like that um, and uh, as time has gone on it's very much expanded out to primates and ungulates and lots of all, all sorts of other animals and there's a really healthy reptile enrichment uh, community right now which is excellent because these are animals that have often not been um, given a whole lot of credit in terms of them requiring um, an environment that is any way <laughs> enriching for them. Um, so really environmental enrichment started in zoos and it started as, as being referred to as environmental enrichment. And what that meant was, was that, you know, they would try to provide animals with more naturalistic uh, environments. So prior to this, you're probably aware like Victorian zoos and things like that, there were just kind of concrete boxes that, that animals were kept in. And obviously there was all sorts of behaviors that were associated with this that were, were indicating these animals were um, experiencing a poor standard of welfare and the thought originally was well let's just make their environments look a little bit more naturalistic and see what happens and a scientist called Hal Markowitz um, came along and he said well really what we should be doing is emphasizing behavioral enrichment and this is way more important yes we might want to provide them with naturalistic things but what's actually more important here is is that we need to collect the data we need to ask the animals collect that data measure their responses and construct enrichment based on behavioral outcomes so what is the animal doing the animal's behavior is information and tells us what it is that they need more of or less of, uh, what they like, what they don't like. Um, and that information is really the most information that we um, that we uh, um, we have and that we can use. And that's what um, appropriate enrichment is about today. It's about measuring those behavioral outcomes. The animal is always right. So the behavior that they demonstrate the information that we glean from that, they're never wrong. <laughs> That's always correct. They are always telling us uh, exactly how they are coping with this particular situation or not. Um, and they're always telling us whether this is something that um, they want in their lives or not. So that's the first thing. And in the literature, there is an argument that says, well, enrichment should be separate from training. Um, and we don't have a whole lot of, of research on this in um, uh, companion dogs there's very little of anything in companion dogs um and there's some research that says well yeah no training should be integrated into enrichment because a lot of the outcomes are the same so for example husbandry training um that you might uh, be familiar with in zoos and collections and things like that helping animals become better able to cope with handling or medical procedures or healthcare procedures or grooming procedures um, and um, so there is some argument back and forth about that and uh, and certainly something that I have um, grappled with and really where I've come to now after years and years of thinking about this is that enrichment and training should be approached the same way and we don't tend to think about it that way but appropriate enrichment is a positive reinforcement process it is about providing animals with predictability and controllability in their environment. It is about providing them with 
um, security and comfort, allowing them to make choices, facilitating some level of agency, you know, so this ability to opt in or out if they wish to, sometimes referred to as consent. Uh, we talk a little bit about that. Can they consent? All of that sort of stuff, conversation for another day. But certainly we can start to think about, um, I think it might be more beneficial if we start to think about training from an enrichment point of view. So appropriate enrichment is a positive reinforcement um, process. So we are um, coming from that point of view now. So I don't think in terms of training programs anymore. I think in terms of enrichment programs and, and um, that's what 100 days of enrichment is. It's a 100 day enrichment program. And it's much more than that because there are several challenges every day. So it's like 500 days or something ridiculous like that. Um, so I want, I want to, to help pet owners see, well, actually, instead of thinking about um, control and loose leash walking and obedience and all of those things, how can we provide animals with appropriate environments? Um, how can we provide them with appropriate exposure? And this is something that you are doing already in your training. You're already doing this. We're already doing a whole lot of this. We, are always working with some sort of environmental management system with dogs, uh, whether that be they need to be on lead around traffic, whether that be we have a baby gate up or we have uh, we have a dog wearing a muzzle or whatever it is, those sorts of things. Um, <laughs> um, someone's given out to me for starting early. That's absolutely acceptable. Um, OK, um, I think we were just kind of trying to move things along. It'll all be available for you. And I'll go back over if you have any questions. Um, I will go right back over. There's no problem whatsoever. Um, um, so we're already doing that. Um, and what's important to understand is, is that enrichment is about making sure that the world provides for their needs. So it's not so much that that environment is devoid of challenge because we're trying to manage everything, but it, that it's teeming with appropriate challenge. And that's where it really becomes um, a little bit more complicated, a little bit less black and white. It's this appropriate enrichment or appropriate challenge provided for dogs. So we're not just managing, we're not just preventing them. So the dog has to be on lead, the dog has to be muzzled, the dog has to be, that's behind a baby gate. Um, all of those sorts of management systems are important for safety. They're important so that we can help them um, cope with their environment um, and we can make sure that we we're, we're helping them develop skills um, to, uh, to to you know and not practicing or rehearsing unwanted behavior so we're already doing that so what we have to do within that management system is making sure hello that um, um, that it, it, it is full of uh, appropriate enrichment, that it's full of appropriate challenge um, for that animal, that, uh, that animal by being prevented from um, um, accessing the world as they would wish to, as they would choose to, we need to make sure that we're providing them with um, lots of appropriate environmental stuff for them. So, um, oh, I'm pleased to be recorded, transmissions breaking up, oh dear. Anybody else having that problem? Um, I, don't, I, I, I don't know enough about this stuff to know how to fix things. Um, I wonder, is it local and in, uh, internet connections? I'm not sure, um, but they'll all be recorded. I've put the title in because I think some people were asking for that. They were finding it difficult to find um, lives and stuff like that. So I've stuck the title in there as well. So um, let's turn this over to you a little bit. I do. A bit. Oh dear. Oh no. I don't know whose end that's from though. How do we fix that? Ruby, do you know? Is there some way of doing that? Um, I have no idea if there's something. No, Loud and Claire here, fine here. Yeah. So it, it may be in it may be local internet. It's probably there's so many people tuning in to this first uh virtual dog conference. Uh, that we're just breaking the internet wouldn't that be a fantastic claim to fame um so i've lost you as well oh perfect i'm not breaking. oh good okay oh no yeah i think i think this might just be the way it is fine for me so it's like it's like 50 50 perfect here and then not great here in other places <laughs> okay 
So we'll do our best. They're being recorded. I think Ruby is putting them into the announcement section in this group. So um, they seem to all be there. So you'll be able to get them. And like I said, I'll um, it'll be next week, but I'll stick a document up um, of all the things that we've um, uh, covered too. So perfect here, perfect here. Oh, here, okay, here now. Oh God. Uh, yeah, all this tech and advancement and we're still struggling sometimes. Okay, so I'm going to turn this over to you, or certainly, don't worry, it's mixed. Um, uh, so what do you think enrichment is? What is it to you? Um, there's no wrong answers to this, but what do you think it is? What is enrichment? And it, relative to any species, it doesn't matter what um, species we're talking about. Uh, not so oh, good on the computer, not so much on phone. Oh, maybe tuning in on computer and laptops and that might be better. Maybe phones are dodgier. I have no idea. Uh, your guess is a good, uh, as good as mine. Um, so what do we think enrichment is? Who has not any idea about that? You've heard the word. You've seen there's been some brilliant talks on enrichment so far yesterday and today. I see Monica there. <laughs> um, giving them something to use their brains. Yeah, so Cheryl, absolutely. We'll take that. Anybody else? Any ideas what um what enrichment is to you? Learning fun games to play with my dog. Yeah, so and like that's an interesting one because sometimes we put enrichment all out into the environment, don't we? And it's stuff that um dogs do independent of us. Um, um, hi Linda. Uh, we we give them things so that they're busy over there, or we we think about it as being something that's happening in the environment. But that's a really really nice one there, yo. Um learning fun games to play with my dog. So things, um, it's about social interaction uh, as well. A, a vehicle to build confidence, absolutely. Oh, so it's not just the computers. Um, improved quality of uh, their lives, mental and physical stimulation, absolutely. Oh my God, you guys are geniuses. It's coming in so fast. You're such fast typers. I can't actually love React fast enough. That's Decker in the background, by the way. He's just going to sleep bored he always turns his um his ass to me when i'm doing these things it's so like so over it me talking about stuff he could give this uh lecture if he could talk allowing the dog or animal to be more dog yes this is like my entire language be more dog doing doggy things yes all the things that we usually don't like um so the digging and the chewing and all of those things things the behaviors that often annoy us enrichment is for using their nose yeah big time and particularly for dogs like they have they live in this olfactory world that we really he's licking his bits now could you just not no shame um the, the slurping isn't me the slurping is, is Decker licking his bits um freezing their nose yes yeah, so they live in this olfactory world that we really don't have a kind of a clear understanding of we don't experience it like that uh, like many other mammals do so giving them things that that allow them to do that is really important because they have to kind of hang around with us and we're basically have no sense of smell relative to them quality in life having choices perfect for freddy hi freddy it helps us um confidence and trust yeah so again there's uh <laughs> hello caught you live <laughs> hi um uh trust so there again is it's about this um uh, relationship and interaction which is really super important too the animal feeling happy yeah absolutely so not stressed and i quite like that because very often when we talk about welfare and we talk about quality of life we talk about uh, negative ind indicators of poor welfare. So we talk about the animal being, you know, starving or not having access to things or living in an environment devoid of, of enrichment. But actually we should be, and we are starting to come from it from the other point of view. So instead of this five freedom model where we're saying, oh, you know, the dog is starving or whatever, um, instead we're going, well, what good nutritious food does the dog have access to? So coming from a positive welfare indicator point of view is a really, really important slant. Given the opportunity for natural environments and species appropriate behaviors, brain games, puzzles and fun, the most important part of this, uh, doing everything in our power to give them a happy, healthy life for both their minds and bodies. Absolutely. I mean, it comes down to us in the end, right? <laughs> doggy things, big time. We love doggy things. A process and an outcome. Oh, we're getting technical now. Joe is taken away. Process and outcome and enhancing the animal's welfare and increase their control and choice. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Decker says hi. Um, He's finished licking his bits now. He's gone back to sleep. He's bored with us. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, hi, Decker. Decker says hi to everybody. Can you see him? Yeah, he's he's asleep. 
one of his major skills in life uh, is sleeping. Uh, letting them have choices, letting them decide if they wish to sniff. Yeah. And that's something that um, is uh, is becoming more popular, I'm happy to say. People are beginning to consider that a little bit more. I still have minor little freak outs when I'm driving around and I see people dragging their dog on from the sniffing spot and stuff like that. But it's definitely becoming something that I am seeing people are more accepting of. And that's uh, really good. Yeah. Dog quality in life. My quality in life. Love it. Love it, David and Bowie. Brilliant. Given uh, strategies to help if Finn has experienced some trigger stacking. Yeah, so stress upon stress upon stress upon stress. Uh, it's the straw that broke the camel's back in human language, I guess. Uh, hi, Decker, please, you're feeling better. Yeah, no, he's doing, he's touch wood. He is back to himself. Yeah, we miss you too, I know. Lockdown is the pits, right? Um, who else feels like that? I guess everybody. Um, we miss you and Yoshi too. Um, okay, so some really good responses there. I love this. I love that so many people have a really good idea of what enrichment is. That's excellent. And notice everybody's right, everybody's correct, <laughs> uh, but everybody's saying different things. And certainly there's lots of emphasis on getting to be a dog, letting them have time to solve. Right. I think that's really important, giving them time. So they process the world differently than we do. Right. And uh, this is particularly important for puppies because they have puppy brain, too. But we often see, you know, hear from puppy owners who will say things like, oh, my puppy refuses to walk, you know, so they'll stop and they kind of plant themselves. And over time, this becomes more there's there's more and more resistance from this puppy. Um, and, you know, sometimes we forget that that puppies are babies, but also dogs in general are processing things differently than we are. So sometimes they need more time to investigate something. They need more time to process it. They don't draw conclusions the same way that we do. That's a really good observation, I think. They, they, they're they giving them that time. So it's not that we're not involved with them uh, and the enrichment process. It's that we're actually letting them take the lead a little bit. And wouldn't this be proper rest? Absolutely. I mean, good Lord. We all know the effects of rest, just from a physiological point of view, and we don't even have to go behavioral with that one. So rest is a really important part of enrichment. And I think something that has happened with us being so excited to enrich their lives that it can sometimes be a little bit about activity and things and action and go, go, go. When actually we have to remember that it's this balance of sometimes just doing nothing, just being and sometimes that's just being with your dog. That's sometimes them just being while you're doing other stuff. So Decker is just being uh, right now. Which way do I have to go? And you can kind of see him there. Um, and this is kind of a, a settled context for him. So when I get on the computer, he just goes to sleep. So it's just like, you know, the boring humans are, the adults are yakking again. Uh, and I'm sure you all have dogs that experience that as well. Um, so some really nice observations there. That's excellent. I love it. Loads and loads and loads. Lots about sniffing, lots about being a dog and that's sometimes difficult to define you know what is a dog what um I don't watch both. yeah there's nothing better there's nothing more relaxing than watching dogs sleep deeply right that kind of deep breathing yeah it sends me to sleep too it's they sh we should record it for insomniacs it's lovely um she's sleeping right now too good girl um so um he's eating the chocolate right now and uh slurping away they're so uh, polite. He's such a gentleman, uh, getting his bits out for everybody um, and slurping away at them too. You had sound effects also, which is also lovely. Um, so really nice observations there. Thanks so much for that. So we had lots of being a dog. So uh, what is being a dog? What is that? Um, and because sometimes we forget because they live in this human uh, world. So being a dog, you know, people nailed it there. We had um, People saying digging and foraging and sniffing and peeing and barking and wagging tails and all of these. I mean, we could list and list and list and list and list. I mean, we, we all of us here are self-confessed dog nuts, I'm sure. Uh, today we got to just be and sat in the park with a box of Krispy Kremes in the sun. Well, we're all jealous. Box of Krispy Kremes. Good on you. Um, in the sun. We had some spring sun in, in Ireland today. So this is like a big deal for us here uh, it's usually rain uh, so we've had a couple of days of sun and it's gone to our heads <laughs> um, um yeah so just being is just the best in the world really isn't it uh, there's nothing better than just hanging out with your dog wherever you are and you're just both breathing deeply and chilling out and 
not thinking about anything particular and all of those things. It's absolutely excellent. I love that so much. Um, okay, so uh, being a dog then, what is what 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 is be more dog or being a dog? So you know th those are the things that we're thinking about when we come to think about species uh, typical uh, needs. You might have really specific observations that you've made about your dog, um, and those are then going to bring us to those more individual needs. Um, but really. Identifying needs, I don't care what category they're in, but um, we're happy to identify uh, a dog's needs um, on an individual basis. It's always a study of one, I think that Susan Friedman says. So what is, in, what is enrichment? So enrichment must be individualized. So we talked about that. So there's some kind of rules to identify it, I guess. So it's individualized. It's suitable for that individual dog. So while we might come with a plan, that dog then gets to have a say in that. They write half of that. It's goal oriented. And this is something that I think can confuse us sometimes, um, you know, because we give the Kong and we go, oh, right, there you go. And we go, well, oh, the dog has finished that Kong now within whatever de defined time uh, timeline. And we say, oh, well, let's make it more complicated. Um, and that's not necessarily the point of this. And it's one of my major grievances with um, the current uh, kind of discussion of enrichment is that it's all about upping challenge, upping challenge, up, upping challenge. And really, that's not the point at all. And I'm not saying you can't do that at all, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying it shouldn't be our priority or shouldn't be our single focus, um, just as we wouldn't necessarily say that about training. So I want you to start thinking about enrichment as being the animal developing, learning behaviours, being taught behaviours by the environment sometimes, but sometimes in interactions with us as well, um, um, that it better help it to cope with its world. And that's what it is. So it's individualised, it's goal oriented. How has this helped this dog? So, you know, the first goal we have with any sort of enrichment protocol is does the animal interact with it? So if we if we provide a puzzle or we provide a Kong or we provide a bed, does the animal do the thing? Do they interact with it? If they don't interact with it at all, well, then it's probably not going to be terribly enriching. Um, enrichment provides choice and lots of people had that. And that's fantastic that we're thinking about that. And the most important choice about this is, is that the dog is always right. The dog is always right. Whatever way they interact with that en enrichment item, that's correct. We might have come in and said, oh, they're supposed to solve that puzzle in a certain way with their nose or they're supposed to solve that puzzle with their foot or they're supposed to lie on the bed. And whatever way the dog interacts with it, they interact with it at all. The animal is always correct. Skinner said that about the rats in the Skinner boxes. The rat is always right. So enrichment allows for the animal to have some control. And this is really important. We are a species that's obsessed with control, right? You know, we talk about self-control, impulse control. We talk about all of those sorts of things. Even when we think we're teaching from a positive re reinforcement point of view, it's all about control. We talk about equipment all the time. We talk about things that we want or need our dogs to do. They need to sit here. They need to lie down there. They need to do this here. Their entire life is about control with very little choice in it. They didn't choose to be born. They didn't choose to come home with us. They didn't choose to live with us. They didn't choose to whatever lifestyle you have, they didn't choose to fit into that. They didn't choose to get to choose any of those things. Um, so allowing them to have a little bit of control. And sometimes all that is, is that the animal learns um, that what their behavior, what happens as a result of their behavior matters. So they do something and they find food. So they move that box over there and they find food. And one of the things that we see on in the 100 days group is this um, uh, growing in confidence of dogs, dogs that a year ago, that did it a year ago, wouldn't stick their head into a box, but now are like in the box, tearing the box apart, having great fun with the box. Um, my puppy, when first meeting a snuffle mat, picked it up and shook out all the treats, right? I had to give him credit for finding the quickest shortcut. There you go, smart puppy. Oliver's puppy is a smart puppy. Absolutely. So, and this one behind me, he would have a tendency towards doing that too. Um, absolutely, up at the ante all the time can cause, yeah, absolutely. And particularly, yeah, in a, and, and that's a good observation there. Susan's saying, upping the ante all the time can cause stress or overstimulation, which in a multi-dog household can be really problematic. Absolutely, particularly if we're talking about valuable resources like food. And when we hide it or we put it in a puzzle, we make it harder to get. So it's much more likely to be guarded, for example. Um, 
and then if they're already kind of stressed because they're going oh shit you know how am I going to get this thing am I going to be able to get this thing um, and then this other guy is over here and is he going to be able to get it before me and things like that yeah that's a really good observation to make a simple choice I gave Cuba uh, every day is what she wants to wear to work she chooses which harness the vest she wants and she wears that one perfect we can give them a simple choice Decker's going to participate now hello buddy hi what's happening kiddo everybody this is Decker Okay, um, there's cooking going on in another part of the house and Decker would love to participate. He's very helpful uh, when it comes to the availability of food. Is that right, bud? Yeah, very helpful. I know, I know. Tell us all about it. It's very boring. Um, so we're allowing that animal to have a little bit of control. What they do, what, what happens, what the, their behavior matters. Um, and, you know, one of the big things that we're talking about here, it facilitates the practicing of species typical behavior. They get to be dogs. And unfortunately for dogs living with um, humans, they don't get to be dogs a whole lot because most of the stuff that uh, we do, um, or most of the stuff that dogs do that we are stuff that we don't like. Um, uh you know the barking and the chewing and the all of those things you know when people look for help about their dog's behavior it's very often deemed a problem you know people say oh my dog is barking and i'm like yeah this is something that happens with dogs it means you don't have a goldfish that's really clear now um so you know so those species typical behaviors are often a problem for us so provide enrichment is about providing appropriate outlets um for that so that they can get all of their jollies out in one way that doesn't cause too much of a problem for humans we still have to we still have to deal with the with the humans so something that i <laughs> i think you're great um he says thank you <laughs> um um one of the things that you will hear me say a whole lot is is that enrichment must be enriching and that means oh I'm looking bits again and that means you do it away from the microphone though um that means that um the those kind of list of kind of rules or, or guidelines that make enrichment enrichment is enriching is actually happening so um appropriate enrichment provides them with lots and lots and lots of opportunities to be set up for success um <laughs> it's not a goldfish I love when people are surprised that they have a dog that barks. My dog is barking. You're like, really? Amazing. That's a first. Um, um, so it sets them up for success. And, you know, if we start talking about training, that's our big thing about training, isn't it? That, you know, from a, a reinforcement based point of view, we want to set everything up, set the entire environment up um, so that that animal is successful. Um, and that means that they get it right all the time. So that's absolutely part of this it's enriching because we set the animal for success and that means that we're not set, we're, we're not setting these really really challenging puzzles or whatever um, and we're listening to that animal their behavior is information one of the things that i think we're really bad at in dog training is collecting data um and is actually documenting what's happening um so um that's something that oh god my students are sick of me saying this, collect the data, collect the data, collect the data. And they want to hit me in the face when I say it. But it is so important that we um, that that we're starting to make observations about our dog's behavior and go, well, what's working and what's not? What sets this dog up for success and what doesn't? Um, and does that happen on a continuous basis? Because when we review and look back at things, uh, Decker says hi, um, we're not always objective, particularly when it comes to our own dogs, my goodness. Um, so the animal's behavior is information. And we're asking, what is the dog getting out of it? What is the dog getting out of it? Is it? Are they getting those things out of it? Are they getting to do species typical behavior? Rather than thinking about, oh, we have to up the challenge now. He should be longer at that thing. We should be, he should be doing more of that thing. Enrichment must be enriching. It must be enriching. Um, so we're, we're thinking of uh, of those sorts of things. So we're collecting the data. What does the dog do with the enrichment um, device or the enrichment protocol? What are our goals and do those things match up as we go? Um, so the first question we're asking is, are they doing the enrichment? Uh, can they choose to opt in and opt out? So can they choose not to do it? Can they choose 
to do it and give up? Can they choose to move over there? Can they choose to avoid it? Can they choose to dive right in and remember whatever way they do it is correct? Um, that Do they get to do it their way? So the way that they are going to do it, remember the animal is always right. Um, so what animals are they leaving or what behaviours even are they leaving to engage with this particular enrichment? So what behaviours are they not doing in order to do this? And that's because an appropriate enrichment programme will have a preventative function. It'll prevent behaviours or we should set it up to prevent the animal uh, needing to carry out behaviours that we don't like or that are potentially damaging. Um, and what behaviours are they doing? So are these healthy behaviours? Are they healthy alternatives to unwanted behaviour? So enrichment should have an eliciting function. It should, should elicit wanted behaviour. And this is particularly relevant because oftentimes when we see dogs engaged with particular enrichment devices, for example, um, often we um, will see them um, using behaviour that we would maybe associate with frustration. Um, so very repetitive behaviours, getting um, faster all the time, but not getting the payoff. And some dogs will absolutely persist with that. And some dogs get a real kick out of that and will go and go and go and go and go, that kind of tenaciousness. But some dogs will just absolutely give up and move away. And people will say, oh, I gave him a Kong or I gave him whatever, but he doesn't use it. And it may have been just too elaborate for that dog on that day and just maybe not able for it. I have had a two-year-old collie I bred uh, come back and a six-month-old pup and knowledge, but with a little testosterone, yeah. Uh, we're all familiar with that. He's easily overstimulated, right? And as all three of my dogs are full males, okay, yeah. So we've got to be real careful then where there can just be some competitiveness. Testosterone can con um, contribute to that. I mean, we all know boys, right? Uh, no offense to any boys. Um, taking time where we are seeing real progress. Oh, that's good. Four months, good. And so he's what? So he's 10 months right now. So he's right in the middle of adolescence right now. Um, so that's a full on fun time spending all my time trying to work out how to keep going forward without blowing the views as I know I totally understand it's really difficult really really difficult lucky I am by myself most of the time even at work so I spend my whole time juggling the data I love it collect the data that's exactly it um okay any questions at this point we've been going like such a like nearly an hour now really uh so anybody got any questions we opt out a lot of days yeah good Absolutely, giving them that, that choice is so important. And them knowing that they have the choice. So them knowing that if they opt um, opted for uh, whatever option, whatever choice they made, that that's meaningful, that we actually see it through. The thing about choice is, is that sometimes you can't give it to them. Sometimes there are situations where the dog can't go out on the road in front of cars. Sometimes we have to do whatever veterinary treatment uh, in an emergency situation. Sometimes that does happen. But really, um, we want to make sure that when we can give them choice that we're doing that. So that might be an 80% of the time, that might be a 90% of the time that they get to, we, we, we kind of follow them around and we get to, to do their option. Um, so that those times when it, it when it does happen, when we can't, because you know we're the primates with big brains, we have to make decisions on their behalf sometimes. Sometimes dogs are idiots. Sometimes, a lot of times dogs are idiots um, about their personal safety. Um, so, and sometimes we just have to, uh, we have to, 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 to make those choices. So it's important that we're getting the opportunity opportunity to um, uh, give them choice when we can. Enrichment today was taking the bulbs uh, out of the packet quicker than I could get them in the ground. Became a game. Oh, bulbs. <laughs> I was thinking like light bulbs. Uh, became a big game. Planting was abandoned. <laughs> Absolutely. Much more fun. Oh, he's two. Okay. So almost. Almost two and a half. Oh, okay. So there's a little bit more sense there. Than that, I can get frustrated with Bowie, Bowie opts out, but the dog is always right. Yeah, I I don't have a solution for that. I get frustrated sometimes too. Sometimes they they don't want to do stuff, or sometimes they want to do stuff in another way, and it's you know, it is it is just life. But the dog is always right, and I think you know you're allowed to get frustrated. I guess, um, you know, and sometimes that's going to come out um, and because you're human um, and that's OK. Hello. Um, big head. I'm scratching his bum. So it's like the physics of dog. Scratch bum, head up. Um, uh, but the dog is always right. Yeah, we, we, we sometimes get frustrated. Yeah, no, I totally get that. I don't have a solution. <laughs> I'm sorry. I give you a con. What's the equivalent? Um, OK, so it's how we learn. Sure, it can be. 
um, I, I don't want to make kind of equivalences there, but certainly frustration certainly can be, hello, dude. Frustration can certainly um, drive performance in some individuals, but it can crush others. So frustration would drive performance in this dog. Uh, he's super resilient and and uh, full on, Jesus, gung ho. Uh, yes, two way enrichment. There we go. So we're learning to breathe deeply, um, count to 10, stick with the dog being always right. Um, okay, everybody okay with that? Um, all right, deep breathing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we have a little bit of, uh, or I certainly reference um, mindfulness on um, 100 days. <laughs> we do have a little bit of a reference to that, uh, but matching their breathing. Uh, when they're just being when they're calm, that can be, you know, that kind of uh, synchronized behaviors is something that uh, is being investigated a little bit more in animals right now. It's generally investigated in kind of herd animals and stuff like that. And you've probably seen what are they murmurations or whatever they're called, the starlings, all of the moving around in groups and things like that. But certainly we're starting to see some research in other species as well. And that's some interesting stuff. But deep breathing, yeah, uh, definitely is something that we we, we need and like. <laughs> um, so what's the dog getting out of it? And I think this is part of our um, data collection. So um, if we're talking about enrichment as a training device, because we now we're going to talk about them as the same thing. Enrichment is training. Training is enrichment. OK, uh, providing it's appropriate and providing the animal is always right. And enrichment is enriching. Um, reinforces our behaviors. Uh, and I think that's sometimes we can get lost with that, that uh, we certainly talk about reinforcers as being things that increase behavior, increase the frequency of behavior overall. But it's important to remember that behavior is reinforced by behavior. So when we say, oh, uh, we're going to reinforce this behavior with this treat, we're, you know, it's kind of shorthand. Really, what we're reinforcing that behavior with is the opportunity to eat. Uh, but it might not just be eating. It might be sniffing out food. So how you present that food, you might toss it in the grass and the dog has to sniff it out. Uh, it might be catching that treat, uh, chewing it or dissecting food. What's reinforcing about reinforcement, I suppose, uh, is the thing is, is, is data that's valuable to collect. So what does what helps in terms of um, bringing that dog up, bringing that dog down, how we present food. So if I start tossing food to this one, to Decker, that definitely is an up. If I feed from my hand, it definitely brings it down a little bit. So we we can reinforce different aspects of behavior um, by, by the way that we present those reinforcers. And what appropriate re enrichment will do is, is it should provide an animal with a high rate of positive reinforcement and a robust reinforcement history. The dog has been right, been right over and over and over and over and over. They've won every time every single time they win. So them interacting with an enrichment device or an enrichment protocol in the tiniest little way produces winning immediately. Um, and we're, we're, we're constantly, constantly providing that feedback for them. That is so important. It's like stress immunization. It builds resist, resilience. It boosts confidence. It boosts stress completely. It's the antidote to learned helplessness. And I know some people talked about uh, learned helplessness in some talks uh, this weekend so far, this kind of shutting down, this not wanting to interact. Um, by building this robust, robust, robust um, uh, history of reinforcement of big wins uh, increases that and it's such an important thing so we have to start thinking about enrichment as being a reinforcement process um, being incredibly important in relation to having a way to provide a very very high rate of reinforcement and building such a robust reinforcement history and that's the real value of this but that's how we should be approaching all teaching that's how we should be approaching um all of the teaching that we do with dogs so what are the dogs getting out of it apart from this reinforcement history that's really important when we're building enrich enrichment programs, we tend to base them on these five categories of enrichment that have come from the shape of enrichment. And I put all these links in there. You'll have all access to this. And there's a diagram and stuff like that. Screen sharing isn't working for me right now. I don't know why, uh, but it's not. So, but but you'll have all of this. And the categories of, enrich of, of enrichment are, they all cross over. So they're social, cognitive, physical world, uh, sensory, and... Um, <laughs> okay, uh, and food based, but they all cross over because if we 
toss food in the snuffle mat. Somebody was talking about snuffle mat there. If you toss food in the snuffle mat, yeah, it's food based, but there's also a huge amount of sensory payoff. That's a part of their physical world. Also, he wants to go and see where the people are, are cooking. He can smell it. Um, um, so it's very clear. You don't have to wait a little bit, buddy. Susan wants me to stay on for another 30 minutes so that we get the schedule right again. I know. Um, but there's a real um, interesting tie up here because when we talk about reinforcing behavior we talk about reinforcing behavior with the functions of behavior so the opportunity to escape which would obviously be a negative reinforcement protocol and um, access to attention access to tangible reinforcers so like that'll be food or, or things like that um, and uh, we talk about sensory payoff so there is a real um uh, <laughs> i see yeah um the pro the, the the peaceful protesting that's happening behind me uh, yeah i know where you'd rather be you're just gonna have to wait um so there's a real tie up between those two things, crossover between those things. So um, and and they form a real central focus to what we're doing. So what is the animal getting out of it? Are they getting some social interaction out of it? And, and some people mention that in terms of what enrichment is. Um, there's a blackbird going nuts outside the window also. Um, and this would form part of that kind of attention function, seeking social attention function to behavior. We talk about there being cognitive payoff. So thinking skills, uh, all of those sorts of things are happening there, higher brain functioning. We talk about modifications being made to their physical habitat, which provides escape opportunities. Yes, escape is a negative reinforcement um, um, kind of part, but the animal getting the opportunity to escape from interaction, from social pressure, from whatever procedure we're doing is a central part of, of enrichment. Remember, it's about making sure the animal has the opportunity to choose and make choices, opting in or opting out. Um, making sure that the, the, the animal's physical world is set up to allow that. So for example, having places where we don't approach our dogs, where we don't harass our dogs. So for Decker, if he's lying on his bed, that is just a place we just don't go. So he gets to have stuff there. He gets to tear stuff up there because it's like life, um, and it's just not a, not a, not an approach that we that we make. Um, it's completely completely his zone, and he can go there and decide this is just what I'm doing right now. Um, so we're setting up their physical world to allow for that. We're making sure that they get tons of sensory payoff. And everybody mentioned olfactory uh, sniffing and, and, and smell and stuff like that. And it's really important. And food based and food based, I tend to leave to last because people are going to do that. They're going to do that. We know that they're going to be able to, um, um, you know, start. That's their awareness of enrichment. And um, so so I leave that to kind of last and, and lower on the priority list. So. The other challenge that we have with making sure that enrichment is enriching, and we kind of touched on that a little bit, is um, we are also providing support and providing for the needs of both ends of the lead. So we're talking about the owners too. And sometimes this is where conflict can arise because, okay, yeah, dogs dig and they bark and they lunge at things and they pee on things, but that can be really hard for people living that. Um, and so our job as professionals is to advocate for the vulnerable party. So the dog is the party that doesn't have a voice. Um, but we have to support the human's welfare too, to allow them to make sure that the animal's welfare is improved. So the, the same rules apply. So we, we had kind of come across that because we'd already said, oh, well, you know, enrichment for humans as well. Um, so working out how to give them a focus and making sure that humans are supported in this too. So getting them sucked in. And really the main reason that I have a lot of food puzzles on 100 Days of Enrichment is because people love it. Um, and it is incredibly reinforcing for pet owners. They love building the thing. They love making the thing. They love watching their dog interacting with it. Um, and you know it's joyous for everybody everybody's enjoying it so there's really cool feedback for the pet owners there's really cool feedback for their dogs their dog is winning is being set up for success we're building a reinforcement history for both ends of the lead and that is super duper crazy important that we're building a reinforcement history for both ends of that of of of, of that relationship so that um that 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 we get buy-in because then it's easier to sell the other stuff it's easier to sell letting the dog just stand there and sniff it's easier to sell that because you've shown them how much their dog loves it and how big a payoff their dog gets for it. They've also enjoyed it so much. Um, so, so it's really important that we're, we're considering that too.
So let's talk a little bit about um, enrichment planning. Um, and I guess we get we have some time to do this um, so that we get back on, on schedule. Um, um, so enrichment is always happening, right? Dogs will find enrichment, um, whether you're uh, happy about that or not. Um, basically, the enrichment that's happening is, I, sorry, I know we do, uh, basically what's happening is, is that the environment is providing access to reinforcers all the time. Those are there. They exist in the environment. There's stuff that your dog enjoys doing, whether you're part of it or not, or whether you have a say in it or not. So those reinforcers exist. So the thing is, is that enrichment is happening already. We might want to you know, kind of direct it a little bit so that it's, um, you know, not that your dog isn't practicing behaviours that maybe will cause a problem down the line or causing a problem already or behaviours that maybe aren't healthy. Again, dogs can sometimes be idiots about this. Um, so all we really want to do is we want to refine what you're already doing. You already feed your dog. You already walk your dog. You already play with your dog. You already rest close to your dog, all of those sorts of things. Um, so we already do that. So, um we want to set some uh, kind of goals for, for our enrichment program. So, so let's start. Let's do a little bit of an enrichment planning right now, if we can. Could we have some time? So do that. So, first of all, the thing that I want you to um, think about is, is maybe pick one dog. If you have multiple dogs, pick one dog because it's just a little bit easier because we don't have that much time. Um, and so, what do you think are the priority needs for that one dog? Um, so. For, for Decker, for example, he really needs access to dissection, to things that he can uh, tear up. He really needs access to um, comfortable, warm bed places, places to sleep. He, he usually likes things up at a height. That's a real thing for him. Um, he needs access to water because he's semi-aquatic. So that's really important. Um, and he needs access to me. He's really, really, really big into social contact with um, me. So those are things that I th those are things that I would be prioritizing in um, my life with him. How do I know to prioritize those things? Because I look at what he's already doing. So that is how he interacts with his world already, whether I have any say in that or not. That is how he interacts with his world. So things to chew and dissect, places to swim, comfy sleeping, close contact with me or just whatever activity I'm involved in, he wants to be involved in. So what sort of um, needs do your individual dogs have? Vast collection of egg boxes and newspaper. Yeah, definitely. One of the things that um, tends to happen when you join 100 Days Enrichment is you suddenly have this like massive um, uh, what was a recycling pile is now an enrichment pile. Hey, dude. Um, so listening from background now, Bronson has decided to double check. He didn't miss any kibble, which I scattered earlier. Uh, coverage still good, though. Phew. I'm glad you got all that kibble, Bronson. Don't let one get away. You never know. You might never be fed again. Um, <laughs> so what sort of needs are you going to prioritize for your uh, dog? What are the things that you think? What is your dog already doing? Um, so that tells us that that's the behavior that's being reinforced, right? Um, I know, I did. I said an hour, didn't I? I did. I said an hour and it's not happened. I know the tr the struggles. Um, not sure is all, it's always a good thing, but Bowie needs her routine. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, I think that's a really good thing. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow when I come to talk about stress and stress busting and stuff like that. But um, controllability and predictability are the two antidotes to stress. So the negative effects of stress. So predictability is I know what's about to happen and when it's about to happen. Controllability is I have behavioral uh, strategies or skills to cope with that. So those two things are super important. And routine for a lot of dogs is really important. And you will um, notice, you know, everybody has made this observation about their dog they know like it's 5 p.m because um their dog starts looking for their dinner and one of the things that we often advise when we deal with people older owners sometimes or people with chronic conditions have to take medication and uh, they need reminders and i will say to them you know what start feeding your dog every day like a really special meal or treat or whatever at like five o'clock and 
whether you know it's five o'clock or not, your dog will be telling you that it's five o'clock and that will remind you to take your medication, for example. So we, we use that all the time. So routine is super important. It goes back to that security, safety, comfort, right? Um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Cuba loves rolling and scratching her back in the grass. So huge sensory payoff there. May also be some um, social stuff there. We think that possible, uh, that scent rolling stuff like that. I have a, a, a poo roller here beside me often, often big into poo, rolling and poo and, and things like that or whatever rolling and whatever um and so there might be some social payoff for that as well so letting everybody look look how beautiful i smell but yeah loves rolling and scratching her back in the long grass when his younger brother is doing his head in and uh, don't mean his frisbee puts all right in the world combined combined with water or mud absolutely if there is mud yeah some dogs are magnets to that i i get i get that absolutely weekends here an issue for us because of change of routine yeah that's really difficult and you know the very very bare basics of that is that people will say oh you know i'm walk my dog at half six in the morning during the week but at the weekends you know, I want to have a lion and nobody told the dog yes that can be really difficult so part of the enrichment planning then is looking at well how can we build in some changes to those routines uh laying on soft bedding so this is knee with the greyhounds and the lurchers yeah who have practically no hair and no layer of fat, uh, watching at the window, biting soft fluffy toys, ripping open bags and cardboard stuff. Yeah, so we have some dissection there, uh, watching at the window, so dog TV really, right? And laying on soft bedding, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lloyd is five, oh boy Lloyd. Indy needs places away from us to sleep. Well, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because some dogs are um, all about like sleeping here, that, this one um but the you know he's an american staffordshire terrier so like the bull pit bull type dogs um tend not to have any space bubble it's not like a thing so she needs places away from us to sleep sorry i just did that uh, and digging rolling and sniffing absolutely she's still a dog <laughs> um yeah so there's a really interesting individual one right and how do we know that we collect we make those observations yes uh so that's really important 100 days help break it up yeah i think so i think having um a fallback because you've done 100 days a couple of times now at this stage i'm sure um so having a fallback and going okay well let's do this thing let's change it up let's do a new activity every day so okay she might know that it's puzzle time or enrichment time or whatever but it's maybe a new activity all the time um so that's a good observation to make for freddie it's access to me 24 7. yeah i mean we are their world yeah um so we might have lots of social interactions over a day and our dog probably doesn't. Uh, it's probably us. Uh, Cube is into poo eating. Yep. Meet your brother over here. Uh, so we always give her a treat when she poos and then walks away from it. Excellent. That's really good. So there you are straight away making an alternative behavior more likely. Um, so walking away from the poo is incompatible with eating it, but also you're giving her an outlet for eating. And possibly if you chucked it in the grass a little bit, you're giving her an outlet for sniffing and, and interacting with it in that way. So that's that's a really good strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yo, know, she's like a toddler. Um, some of her favorite things while out are rolling and stinky stuff. Yes, always the dogs with the thickest coats. Uh, walking on walls. So some some real kind of sensory um, payoff there, and some kind of profile reception and stuff like that. Splashing the muddy spills, of course. Uh, yes, that's absolutely part of it. D be more dog is what we said, wasn't it? Harris needs to sniff and enjoy searching for food and dead birds. All the one to the dogs, I guess. Uh, food slash dead birds. Yeah, he always really wants to cuddle up on the sofa to sleep. Yeah, so comfy, cushioned, smells of us up at a height. Lots of things that dogs really, really like um, to have in their sleeping world. Touch. Uh, Einstein loves ears and head been rubbed. Yeah, massive sensory payoff, but also huge social stuff there. So handling their faces and ears and those velvety ears. I mean, good Lord. Um, um, yeah, absolutely. And like that kind of aloe grooming, you know, what they might do to one another. Looking at the window, wants me to be with them. Yes, yeah, so you are just a supervisor. Contact with me preferably all the time. Routine, routine and walk, sniffing, dissecting, playing, sleeping in bed. I love that you guys have so many uh, observations about your dogs. Rob just likes to go down the covers for a snuggle. Yeah, I'm with you, Rob. Go for it. Most of my work during the week is online, so watching this is comfort for Bowie at the weekend. Oh, she's out. Oh, well, that's good. It's that, you know, my human is there. I know they're going to be here for a while. I can relax. I don't have to watch for him 
going off again or, or going missing on me or changing your routine. Everything is OK. It's that safety and security. Yeah. Cuba loves it when I rub her head with a towel. Yeah. So not only are you removing the water, um, but also it's that sensory payoff it's, and the friction of the towel may be comfortable too. Um, yeah, absolutely. Really nicely identified for Wiley. Uh, oh, go on. Foraging, access to water, mud, access to me, dissection, cool, cozy, sweat, and sniffing for critters. Oh, yeah. Rolling in the dead ones. Oh, my goodness. Uh, dissection is huge for Bronson. 5,000 pigs, <laughs> pigs of meth. <laughs> and oh, a short, noisy life, the squeaky pigs. Sniffing has become 10 times more important as he's got older. That's an interesting observation, right? Move too fast. Yes. So there's a, there's a, a change in behavior that might come with age. So there, there might be other sensory and cognitive deterioration as they age happens the best of us, Bronson. Um, so suddenly their nose might become a real central focus. And just because, you know, there might be slight uh, physiological changes, and arthritic change to joints and stuff like that, which can happen as we age. Um, he's suddenly sniffing a whole lot more. There's a really cool observation there and a change in behavior. So prior, you might have said that the opportunity to move fast and run around and all of those sorts of things um, were up there for him. But now that's less of a thing for him. So sniffing has become uh, more of an option um, for him. Oh, he no, dude, you just gotta wait. Um, <clears throat> so that's a really cool observation. I love rolling in and eating poo. Yeah, we're it's like a support group for coprophagic dogs in here. Water splashing, but doesn't swim. That's okay. And again, remember the dog's always correct. So we might say, Oh, here you are, deep water, go swimming. And the dog's, Nah, this is how I enjoy it splashing in it. Safety, absolutely. Safety and security with their human. Uh, for my dog, digging, social interactions with both people and other dogs uh, and our cat, <laughs> the whole, all the species. Uh, routine and structure is big too. Good observation. Rolling and certain textures to roll in. Cool. That's interesting. Uh, grass and stuff. Are there other textures that um, the dog likes to roll in? Going swimming later. Oh, lucky you. We're on lockdown here and we can't travel uh, 5k from our home. So we can't get swimming in the beach and it is painful. Uh, so I'm envious. Obi is so hot headed hunting the brain cell. <laughs> it's his favorite game, good man. Uh, Mozart likes to find stones in the water. Bring those trophies home. We don't have any stones at home, obviously. Be these are better stones. Oh, that's a nice way of putting foraging. It's finding my phone. Oh, good. You have some good internet. Love the name Mozart. He's lovely. I think he's um, Cavachon. Is that right, Fiona? Uh, Mozart. Uh, oh, Harris also loves running up and then charging down hills. Yay. Gets the blood flowing. So like that arousal from exercise, there's massive payoff there. You know, um, we, we do that too. Routine, I get up the same time every day. So sit at the same breakfast. Yeah. I, you know what? I think it's a it's a good thing. I think if I think we look at how the dog is dealing with it. Right. Um, I think I think it's if, if you can do that, I think that's OK. I wonder, though, just in terms of preparing for something coming down the line, should we have things in place so that the dog has a little bit more versatility? Now, you've got to be real careful with that and and uh, and we don't have enough time to go through the whole thing, but certainly I would think about it because you don't know what's coming down the line. So if we want the dog to be able to cope with um, a breakfast time that's slightly later or earlier because stuff might change uh, at that point, um, I wonder, should we be preparing them for that, uh, possibly. But I think routine is good. And I think it, it, it lends safety and security um, for them. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Mozart is a cabochon. Um, OK, we're kind of winding down there. Um, is that OK with everybody? Any feedback there before we go to the next person? Um, I think I've said all the things. Um, yeah. David's saying there, just watch for frustration. This is in relation to routine, I think. Yeah, and I think we have to watch for, um, like if we lose predictability, that's when we're um, um, going to um, 
see some stress related behavior. And I think we have to do it really, really gradually and collecting that data and knowing when we're pushing the dog too far, I think is really important. But you could start with simple things. You don't necessarily need to change the time. You can change other parts of the routine too. Um, so you could change what he gets. You could change where he gets fed, how he gets fed. You could you can change the picture as well around it just to lend in some some versatility. Is there a way to use enrichment activities to encourage a behavior that causes encourages a behavior that causes a fear flight response linda is asking this is there a way to use enrichment activities to encourage behavior that causes do you mean that um we would increase the dog sensitivity is that what that refers to uh yeah you certainly can make them flightier just by increasing stress and frustration um certainly that you know once we engage the stress systems i'm going to talk a little bit about this tomorrow evening too um that can they can be engaged on a chronic basis which means that the dog is more sensitive to things and maybe has disproportionate responses to those stressful um uh, stimuli so yeah i just clarify your question there if you can for me or um we bring it tomorrow because it's, it relates to what we're going to talk about tomorrow so you can bring it tomorrow too rolling an artificial grass yeah it's really scratchy when i was putting netting on the plants while we were to roll and scratch it. very helpful puppy uh yeah so cool other textures um my routine is no routine yeah, I'm a little bit like that too. So we get up when we get up and we go, we go and he just, he's just, I'm the constant, I guess. He said I can take them anywhere with no hassle. Yeah. Uh, this I'm so glad. Thanks so much for coming. I'm so delighted that you came here. I just changed Bowie's food bowl, right? Changing the, uh, the, the picture a little bit. He is afraid of walking because of triggers, right? Oh yeah. So absolutely. Um, I think there is an overemphasis on um, taking dogs for walks. Uh, I 100 percent agree with that. Uh, um, like it is such the, the traditional idea of a walk is such not a beneficial thing for most dogs. Um, and again, they tolerate it. They're adaptive. They just like us too much um, and they put up with it. But I, I, I don't think that going out for kind of these traditional walks where dogs are walked on like uh, through villages or towns or pathways and um, these straight concrete paths that you know is real antecedent arrangement for us we walk that way that's not how dogs approach the world at all it's all zigzagging and backwards and forwards and up down and all the rest of it. and then they're on a lead and they can't do the things that they want to do because they've been followed by this slow two-legger uh, that's there so yeah i i i don't know that we if we were talking about this from a training point of view we would say let's not put this dog in a situation where they are exposed to triggers to such a point that they find it difficult to cope so they're afraid i mean you use the term afraid and um, so that tells us that the, there is there is something happening there in terms of um eliciting a stress response um so why would we bring them out into the world if that does that and particularly the world where it's difficult to control stuff um because the world is not under our control yet um but um yeah certainly um i i would say that we can look at other things and walking uh, taking our dogs on outing should be such a small part of the enrichment program that we provide them like it's such a teeny tiny part of it uh so we don't have to emphasize it um thanks love the stuff about choice yeah uh i give harris dinner and three options to see which are cool uh, and he went for snuffle mat first, then bowl, then con toy. So he's contra freeloading a little bit. Uh, I was surprised. That's really that's an excellent observation. Um, we talk a little bit about whether dogs can't freeload in 100 days a little bit too. My dog doesn't at all. Always goes for the free, easy food first and then we'll go for the other thing. So that's a cool observation. Try that again. Try that again. Try that with different options. Generally speaking, two options is the best way to collect data and it's easier for dogs. If we go above three, they're probably not able to make cool choices. Um, didn't see any change. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ruby. Big round of applause, what we'd say in Ireland, Billabus for Ruby organizing all this crazy stuff in like three days or something. Uh, internet got better, oh, I'm glad. Uh, thanks, Anne, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, looking forward to tomorrow. Cool, me too. Uh, thanks, that's a relief, yeah. So I think you, you probably don't do a whole lot of normal walks with him. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Don. Thanks, Carol, hi, Carol. Uh, I see so many people dragging. I know. It makes me so sad. Uh, hi, Christy. I'm just going now, so it's hi and bye. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Thanks, Joe, for coming. Thank you so much. It's so good to know that you're not talking into the abyss. 
Uh, it's the dog's walk, right? Exactly. If they only get out of the house for like one hour, if even, out of 24, needs to be their walk. We alternate the feeding regime. Yeah, sometimes scattered across the floor. Good. That's a good way to add some versatility. This, oh, thank you, Linda. Thanks so much for coming. Hearts to David too. Great chat. Thanks, Kim. See you tomorrow. Uh, you're welcome, Melissa. Oh, ball for Decker, always. I'm surprised there's not a ball actually here. Very rare uh, that there isn't a ball in his mouth. Uh, thanks, Nee, for coming. Thanks, George. Uh, oh, I'm so glad you've learned. Thanks, Yo, and hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Do correct me. Um, Tracy, thanks a million. I think that's everybody. Thanks so much. Gotta go. We let get, get uh, ready for the next person. Go have a toilet break. This is a long one. Get your snacks sorted. I'll see you tomorrow. I can't remember. And get rid of the bloody cell phones. Good advice. That's what I'm about to do right now. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. I can't remember what time. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about stress busting. So all of this 100 days stuff will come up again because it's all I talk about. I bring a meal for my dogs outside and they enjoy foraging in the long grass. Absolutely no power walks. Good. Make it a sniff rather than a walk. I think that's a good uh, <laughs> um, a good way to end it. I think you feel like we're back at the classroom. I know, I know. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the way we'll end it then. We'll edit then. Make it a sniff rather than a walk. I think that's a good way to end it. Thank you so much. You're all so awesome to be here giving up your Saturday nights. I mean, we're on lockdown, so we're not going anywhere anyway. Thanks. Bye. Bye, 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 bye.